Please, as you're able to find a sign and pass the pew pad. And while you're doing that, I want to highlight just two announcements. There's several good important announcements printed in the back of the bulletin, but I want to make sure everybody knows that both Transformation Tuesday, our elementary school program on Tuesday afternoons, and the confirmation class on Wednesday, both of them are deferred until next week because some people want a time off for Thanksgiving. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Any other announcements anyone needs to share? Then let us worship God. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, you appointed Jesus Christ to rule over all things and made us servants in your kingdom. Grant us grace to perceive more of your perceptual, loving presence. Empower us to love the unloved and to minister to all in need. At the right time, bring us to the eternal realm where we will worship and adore you and participate in your everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. We thank you for dying in our place to give us eternal life. 
We thank you for your present presence with us. We thank you for the promise of eternity with you in paradise. Yet we confess that in certain areas of our lives, we sometimes resist crowning you as Lord. We also confess that we sometimes fail to spend enough time with you. And in failing to spend sufficient time with you, we forfeit fruit, including the love, joy, and peace that we desire. Love, joy, and peace that can be found in you alone. Please forgive us. Lord, as we await the coming day when every knee will bow before you and every tongue will confess that you are Lord, give us faith to trust you and courage to surrender to you. Live and rule in us, Lord Jesus, and gently help us to abide in you. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son whom he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us pass the peace.
Are there any other young ones who would like to come down? That was fantastic. Quartet's got a real act to follow now. <laughs> well, today I want to talk with you about two things that Jesus said, and what one of the things that makes these two things that Jesus said even more amazing is that he said them while he was on the cross. And why was Jesus on the cross? Brianna. He suffered for us. Yes, that's right. Did you want to add to that, Ella? Did I see your hand up? He died. He suffered for our sins and died for us. And that is the good news of the gospel. Jesus died in our place. And the first thing he said when he was on the cross he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And that's what the cross is all about, our forgiveness. And the next thing he said, well, let's go back to forgiveness. We all know that God forgives us. But did you know that God tells us that we need to forgive other people? Yeah, sometimes forgiveness is hard. One of the best things to do to work on forgiving people is to pray for the people we want to forgive and to ask God to help us to forgive. And the next thing Jesus said, which is also in our scripture reading for today, Jesus said to one of the criminals who was dying next to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. And that is wonderful news. Because it tells us that the minute a Christian dies, they go to be with Jesus in a perfect place. Will you guys pray with me? Great and gracious God, thank you for your love and forgiveness. Thank you for faith, salvation, and eternal life. Help us to follow Jesus. And to trust him. This day and forever. This day and forever. Amen. Great job, guys. This way. As they are filing now, I want to make an announcement that I neglected to make. Um, today at um, it's Garrett Hennis, right? Garrett Hennis Funeral Home will be um, visitation for Bob Schneider from 1 to 5. And the service will be tomorrow, Monday, here at 11. Please keep the Schneider family in your prayers. Please pray with me. Sovereign God, cause your word to roll in our hearts and the Holy Spirit to govern our lives until at last we see the fulfillment of the realm of justice, peace, and love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And then a familiar scripture to you, Psalm 100. Shout for the joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him 
and praise his name, for the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Heads up, if you've not already turned to hymn number 227, please do so. The reason we're singing a hymn in this spot is as I was reading today's scripture readings, I was looking at it on Monday, this hymn just popped in my mind. And I asked if we knew it and was told we did. So we're gonna sing it because this hymn, hymn number 227, comes directly from today's scripture reading. Which is Luke chapter 23, 33 to 43. This text is picked by the Revised Common Lectionary for Christ the King Sunday. And then we see Jesus as a different kind of king. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And the soldiers divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written notice above him, which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him, saying, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked the first, saying, don't you fear God, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then that second thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today, you will be with me in paradise. God's word for us, God's children. Thanks be to God. God. No matter how many times I read or hear that, 
It amazes me still. They had nearly beaten him to death. They were now nailing him to a cross, and Jesus prayed for them to be forgiven. That prayer certainly asked the Father to forgive the Roman soldiers, the executioners. Jesus was probably also praying for the Jewish leaders who had conspired with the Romans into manipulating Pilate to pronounce the death sentence. In praying for the people who were directly responsible for his death, Jesus was practicing what he preached. He was loving his enemies and praying for those who persecute us. In praying for those directly responsible for his death, Jesus was also fulfilling the word of the Lord spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Roughly 700 years before it happened, the prophet Isaiah described the crucifixion of Jesus in great detail. Listen to these prophecies. See them fulfilled in Jesus. And as you see Jesus fulfilling prophecy, recognize him as ruling king, reigning even from the cross. In Isaiah 52 and 53, speaking of the crucified Christ, Isaiah wrote these words. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. He poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Just as the Holy Spirit had enabled Isaiah to foresee, the crucified Jesus was horribly disfigured and beaten. He was pierced and crushed in our place. He bore our sin, and the punishment that brought us peace was placed upon him. Crucified between two thieves, Jesus was, in the words of Isaiah, numbered with the transgressors. And in praying, Father, forgive them. Jesus made intercession for the transgressors, exactly as Isaiah had been shown seven centuries beforehand. In a sense, that prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, is also a prayer for me and for you. Jesus suffered and died to take away sin. And because we are sinners, we are in part responsible for what he suffered because it was our sins, among, our sins were among those for which he suffered. Because of Jesus, you and I can be fully forgiven by God. All we have to do is trust in Jesus. Trust in his saving work. Ask for forgiveness in his name, and then do our prayerful best to faithfully follow and obey our risen Lord and Savior. As I reminded the children, I remind us the God who freely forgives us also commands us to freely forgive. And because forgiveness is hard, Jesus is ready, willing, and able to help us to forgive. The second words of the crucified Christ were spoken to that repentant thief. How did the repentant thief come to his amazing faith? Well, that's a question we'll have to wait and ask him. But I believe that it was the Holy Spirit who opened the eyes and the heart of that dying man. I believe that the Holy Spirit showed him the truth and gave him the ability to see that the dying man next to him was in fact the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and that he did have a kingdom and was soon to be, be entering it. 
And I believe the Holy Spirit brought that second thief to faith and repentance. And to that repentant thief, Jesus said the wonderful words, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Those words mean that the minute a Christian dies, that Christian goes to be with Jesus in paradise. That's one of the most precious promises ever given. Thanks be to God. On the day Jesus was crucified, there was a lot of confusion about who was running things. Today is Christ the King Sunday, and today we talk about straightening that question out. Several different people thought they had the power and were in charge. The Jewish rulers thought they had the power, but they could not crucify Jesus without first gave permission from the Romans who ruled over them. King Herod thought he was in charge, but when Jesus was brought before Herod and Herod demanded a miracle, Jesus ignored him. Herod questioned Jesus and Jesus ignored him. Governor Pilate said to Jesus, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you know that I have power to either crucify you or set you free? And Jesus said, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Later that same day, we see Pilate powerless. The Roman ruler ends up bowing before the demands of the Jewish mob, even though Pilate had tried him and found him innocent. When we study the chain of events, we see that the real power that day was in a place that few recognized. The real power was in the hands of God the Father and God the Son, and so it will always be. John chapter 18 vividly demonstrates that Jesus was in complete control. Most of the time, we can read the Bible in English in the translation that we prefer and see 95 plus percent of what's in the text. However, there are two important aspects of John 18 that are difficult to see unless we're reading the original Greek text. First off, in 18.3, it is absolutely clear and beyond a shadow of a doubt that the mob that came to arrest Jesus included both Jewish temple guards and Roman soldiers. We know that because the word translated as detachment of soldiers is spirion. And spirion means a Roman cohort. It's not a cohort of someone else. It's not a different division. Spirion means Roman cohort, which means 600 soldiers. Now, we do know from ancient sources, including Josephus, that Roman cohorts sometimes functioned at less than full strength. So it's possible that fewer than 600 Roman soldiers that night were sent to arrest Jesus. But it's also possible that all 600 soldiers were there along with the Jewish temple guard. Now, sending 600 soldiers to arrest a single man may sound excessive, but it was Passover time. There were perhaps a million extra people in the city of Jerusalem that day, there for Passover, and the city was charged <coughs> and tense. Jesus was extremely popular with some people, and Rome reasoned that arresting Jesus might result in a riot. Plus, Rome enjoyed flexing its military muscles before a watching world. For example, we know from Acts 23 that when the Apostle Paul was being escorted to his trial before Governor Felix, the Romans assigned as Paul's guard 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. 
470 men were assigned to escort Paul to his trial for Felix. And since Rome assigned 470 soldiers to guard Paul, they might well have sent 600 to arrest Jesus. And of course, in addition to the soldiers of Rome, there were the Jewish temple guards. This mixed mob of Roman soldiers and Jewish guards massively outnumbered Jesus and the 11 disciples. The Jews and the Romans collaborated to ensure that there was no way Jesus could escape. But escaping was not what Jesus had in mind. Here we see the second thing that is difficult to see in any English text of which I'm aware. Please listen to John 18, 18, 4 through 6. This is the way the NIV translates it. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now some translations, like the New American Standard and the King James, do us the courtesy of italicizing words that are not in the original Greek text. I looked in the Pew Bible, and the Pew Bible does not italicize it. But if you want to see it with your own eyes, get it a New American Standard or a King James or a New King James, and you'll see those words that aren't really there. They'll be italicized. And you will see that the word he, as in I am he, the word he is not there in John 18, 5, 6, or 8. Annotated Bibles with footnotes will often say that the word he does not occur in John 18, 5, 6, or 8. Jesus did not say, I am he. He said, Ego e me, I am. Some of you already are thinking why that's so important. Exodus chapter 3, the meeting between God and Moses at the burning bush. Moses says to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I say to them? God said to Moses, Ahaya asher ahaya, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. That's a fascinating text on which we could spend many hours, but we don't have many hours. So trust me when I say that I am is not God's name. I am who I am is not God's name. None of, in the Hebrew text, there's not a place where the God of Israel is called I am or I am who I am. Not one place. But there are in excess of 6,000 places where the God of Israel is called Yahweh. Yahweh is God's name, and I am is like a commentary on Yahweh. God is saying, I am Yahweh and I am your God. I am present. I am with you. I am yours. But centuries before God became flesh in Jesus Christ, the words I am, because of Exodus 3, had become kind of a nickname for Yahweh. Jesus frequently used the words, Ego e me, I am, to claim that he was and is God. A classic example where it's impossible to miss the point is John 8, 58. Jesus says, Truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus was clearly claiming to be the God of Israel. And we know that the crowd understood. Why do we know that the crowd understood that Jesus claimed to be God? 
Because in the very next verse, they started picking up stones to throw them at him, to stone to death for blasphemy. Recognizing that the word he does not occur in John 18, 5, 6, or 8. Recognizing that Jesus actually said, I am. And remembering that the words I am functioned as a nickname for Yahweh. We get a completely different picture of what was happening there in John 18. Please listen again. This is a more literal translation. Mine. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, I am. When Jesus said, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Picture that scene. Nothing that night surprised Jesus. We read, he knew everything was going to happen. The army came to arrest him, but rather than running away, he went forward to them. He asked them who they were looking for. They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, hey, go in me, I am. Then, perhaps 600 plus men took a step back and fell to the ground before him. Jesus was proving to that army and to everybody else, that he was in complete control of that situation. Jesus was also giving us a preview of that great and wonderful day, which may or may not be far away, that day that we read about in Philippians 2, when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. After making that army fall down before him, Jesus allowed them to get up, and then he asked them a second time, Who is it you want? They again say, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many of you have been arrested? <laughs> well, if you haven't been arrested, you've at least seen a police show. When somebody gets arrested, the person getting arrested gets questioned, right? Well, not Jesus. Jesus is getting arrested, and he does the questioning. Why? Because he's the king of kings and lord of lords. Instead of the arresting mob questioning Jesus, Jesus questions them. He twice makes them say that they are looking for him. And then Jesus, in full control, after twice forcing the arresting mob to say they're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus says, okay, you let these men go. He questions and he takes charge, even as he puts out his hands to be bound. Jesus was accomplishing what he had spoken of previously, back in John 10, when he said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay down my life, and I have authority to take it back up again, because that is the command I received from my Father. On the night of his arrest, Jesus wasn't captured. He defeated the arrest mob and then surrendered to them. And he did it because he knew the plan knew that he was about to give his life for the life of his sheep. Even as he surrendered to that mom, he retained control of the situation. However, and please, 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 with sugar on top, understand this. The fact that Jesus was in complete control did not make it easy for him. The fact that he was in complete control did not mean that he was not about to suffer more than we can imagine. And that is extremely important for us to remember. Jesus was in complete control, but the lead-weighted whip still shredded his flesh, and the nails still bit into his bones. He was in complete control, but those six hours on the cross were worse than anything we'll ever understand. Jesus was in complete control, but he still suffered horrific agony. And he allowed himself to suffer that horrific agony because he understood the big picture 
of God's plan. He understood that his suffering was an essential part of the salvation of the sheep, those whom the Father had given to him. God's grace saved children. Now friends, despite what we might think, especially when we watch the news, Jesus is still in complete control. But the fact that Jesus was in control back then did not prevent him from suffering. And that's the thing I'm saying, please, please, please recognize. The fact that Jesus was in complete control did not prevent him from suffering. There is, thank God there is, a place where there is no suffering, a place where there are no more tears and no more death. There is such a place, but this earth is not that place. That place is our future. Right now, in this place, Jesus is in control. But the fact that our loving Lord is in control didn't prevent him from suffering back then, and it will not always prevent us from suffering right now. In fact, Jesus says in John 16, 33, In this world, you will have trouble. But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Brothers and sisters in Christ, sometimes times are tough. But if we trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then no matter what we experience, we can trust that Jesus is working to make all things work for the good of those who love God. Jesus is working to fulfill the perfect plan, a perfect plan that includes conforming you and I into his own likeness and the perfect plan that includes bringing us into the perfect place prepared for us by our risen Savior, the place prepared for us in the house of God the Father. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Holy Triune God, on this Christ the King Sunday, we ask that you would gently enthrone the risen Christ in all of our hearts, cause him to rule in our homes, in our minds, our decisions, and over our mouths. We ask this for all your children. We ask you that as we await the triumphant return of King Jesus, that you would work your sovereignty through the leaders that the world currently has. We ask you to give grace, every needed grace, to all people who are persecuted or sick or who lack the basic comforts and necessities of life. We pray for those who defend us, those who protect us, and for one another, Lord. Help each of us day by day to win the victories that come only from surrendering to you. We ask these things in our Savior's name, praying the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we read in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Let us bring our gifts to the Lord. Look down the chair.
shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace today and forever. Amen. Let me run.